Politics are a powerful and dynamic human creation, a truth most evident in revolutions around the world. A revolution, in a political sense, is a sudden and seismic shift from one form of government to another. While revolutions come in many forms, they often share four characteristics in varying degrees. Dissident elites, mass frustration, shared motivation, and state crises. Altogether, these factors have ignited some of the most radical changes throughout history. Revolutions are often facilitated by a dissident elite. This particular group is comprised of people with wealth, power, or an education who are willing to challenge the existing administration. Elites played a critical role in the American Revolution, one of the earliest revolutions in modern history. American colonists under the rule of Great Britain won a war for their independence in 1783. Colonial elites like Thomas Jefferson, who would later become a United States president, fueled the revolt by contributing their resources toward reform. Frustration among the masses also plays a critical role in social upheavals. When a large percentage of a population feels grave discontent with their political, economic, and social institutions, they may revolt. Only a few years after the American Revolution, the people of France initiated their own revolt. Several factors, including economic difficulties and an antiquated feudal system that fueled social inequalities, all contributed to the dissent. Ultimately, French society permanently ousted their monarchy and replaced it with a republic. Another characteristic found in revolutions is a shared motivation. Shared motivations are what unify a large enough number of people, specifically from multiple classes and groups, to effectively rebel. These motivations helped the revolutions of Latin America in the early 19th century. Ruled by Spain and Portugal at the time, colonists from multiple Latin American classes and ethnicities were inspired by the Enlightenment. The intellectual movement challenged tradition, including traditional forms of governance, and ended up playing a role in the fight for colonists' independence in Latin America. Severe state crises also motivate revolutions. In particular, an administration's failure to meet the needs of its people make it vulnerable to insurgency. The revolutions of early 20th century Russia occurred because of the government's exceptional frailty. Its political, military, and economic systems had been virtually decimated by the state's defeats in World War I. The nation's power vacuum then led to revolts that replaced Russia's imperial state and created the world's first communist regime. Virtually all revolutions experience severe state crises, shared motivations, mass frustrations, and a dissident elite to some degree. While revolutions may involve different players, governments, and cultures, the characteristics they share help them transcend their differences and demonstrate the dynamism of human nature and politics. A little short little video there, of course, on the history of revolutions, which have, you know, affected pretty much everything worldwide uh, overall. So, you know, welcome back, Daniel Simon, of course, at Baton Rouge Community College. I uh, hope you had a great weekend uh, overall. Uh, cool, cooler weather here, of course, in Louisiana uh, right now. So uh, anyway, um, of course, this week we'll be moving on week. I think it's week nine we're in, I know, in this class, uh, talking about the really French Revolution. Of course, I'll get into the age of Napoleon uh, also uh, as well, uh, probably mostly later in the week. So anyway, it looks like we got a, lot, a bunch of students watching live uh, right now. Uh, on YouTube, I know, in the stream. It looks like I got Carmen joining us this morning. Connor's also out there this morning. Uh, also, Shakina, hope you're having a great morning uh, overall. Asia, it uh, looks like Mark has also joined us too as well. Rohan, 
uh, Trevor, and also it looks like Logan just joined us as well. In StreamYard, we've got a few people right now, Miracle, Grace, Michaela, and Jeannie. Uh, if anybody wants to join me, of course, right now, uh, of course, here's the link to StreamYard, by the way, dot com uh, right below. So uh, before I get started today, I did want to kind of talk about, uh, of course, a few reminders about, you know, where we're at in the class, of course, right now. Uh, as of now, you all have a major quiz uh, that's due uh, coming up. I guess in so many days, uh, which will be, of course, the, I think it's number four quiz, but it's on the British Empire, Rise of the British Empire, those lectures I had, of course, previously before that we did. Uh, so that lecture's out, that quiz is out right now uh, to wrap that up. And then uh, sec uh, second vocab, yeah, that, you haven't turned that in. Uh, that needs to be turned in this week. Uh, I think I have it still open uh, if you want to turn it in, but you should you know focus on the next one, the third one that's coming up that I've already given you already at this point. So that's about where we're at. I'll uh, probably have some other Canvas quizzes coming up that I'm going to announce about, about later. I'm still working on uh, currently, but I know we'll probably definitely have one on this period we're doing right now, of course, French Revolution and Age of Napoleon. So uh, anyway, uh, looks like Carlette's also in court and you're also joining us this morning uh, as well. So um, now, before I get started, of course, I am going to, of course, talk about like the background of what what you know we'll talk about today. I am going to first, of course, uh, you know, get into primarily talking about the you know French Revolutionary period, which really occurs in France, uh, affects also Europe uh, over like a ten year period. It spawns a bunch of wars, uh, French Revolutionary Wars, uh, primarily. Uh, then later you have the age of Napoleon comes in with the Napoleonic Wars as well, which affects Europe, also affects the world, which it does. Because I think one thing about the French Revolution and age of Napoleon was it it did kind of create a lot of nationalism, you know, throughout Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, if you have a comment, of course, or question during the live stream, of course, let me know, or you always leave a comment question later on my channel. You can also subscribe to my channel uh, as well uh, below below to the right. Little, little thing down there, subscribe button. So anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead and first talk about today, a little background about, of course, you know, the French Revolution, you know, what it was basically about. Uh, and it wasn't just a political revolution in France. Uh, if you look at France itself, uh, it was really still in feudal times uh, in that 18th century when, it, of course, late 18th century, when it broke out overall. So it's kind of a political revolution, but it was also a social one uh, because of the fact that you had all these upper classes that had all the, the power and the rights uh, in the country. And so you had all these lower classes that wanted to have more power, lower classes like peasants and middle class, uh, et cetera. Uh, it also led to the end of, you know, bourbon absolutism, like divine right, where the king had pretty much ruled without uh, any legislation or any kind of check on his power. Uh, and so it does lead to later reforms in France. You know, France does go to eventual republic, although there is this period where Napoleon comes in, as you know, that also uh, kind of briefly puts the country back into like a monarchy. Uh, but Napoleon was, you know, known for his, you know, political reforms also the country, like the, you know, the famous uh, Napoleonic Code uh, that we'll get to later. So it does affect not just France, but a lot of Western European countries are heavily affected, you know, by the by the French Revolution uh, in general. Uh, the revolution later turned deadly, of course, violent. You know, we'll talk about that later, uh, like with the reign of terror, which would kill thousands of people uh, throughout the country. Uh, it's kind of been sometimes compared with, uh, you know, the Soviet Union uh, under like Joseph Stalin, where they had all those political repression. So, yeah, that happened. Uh, as well in the country, especially when the Jacobins, you know, take over uh, and all that. We'll talk about later, you know, there's uh, so many things that, that the revolution's famous for, you know, the storming of the Bastille, uh, the use of the guillotine to execute people uh, during the revolution. And then France even adopts a new flag, which you kind of see in the background, that, that tricolor you know, flag that they're kind of known for, uh, that's blue, white, and red. So, yeah, let me go ahead and talk about the background, of course, uh, of the revolution. Uh, of course, one of the things I always talk about, you know, is kind of some ca major causes, of course, uh, of the revolution. 
uh, is that, you know, it all occurs under this king, Louis the 16th. Louis the 16th was the fifth Bourbon king, of course, at the time when he came into power. And um, anyway, uh, he reigned from 1774 to 1792. Uh, he was actually the grandson of Louis the 15th, who had reigned prior to that, who had been basically uh, Louis the 14th's great grandson, uh, who reigned pretty long time, too like close to about almost 60 years uh, that he was in power. Uh, however, a lot of historians kind of view um, Louis XVI as being kind of inept uh, as a ruler, maybe incompetent. Uh, a lot of people viewed him as like being basically um, not really up up for the role, you know, when when the revolution actually, you know, occurred uh, and all that. And so a lot of times, uh, a, lot, a lot of people kind of blame him, him as one of the reasons why maybe the revolution happened. I don't know what would happen. I think if Louis XIV would have been the king, it probably would have been crushed. But 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 Louis XVI was really, really young when he came in. Um, he uh, really didn't want to be king. In fact, his father uh, was actually the Dauphin, uh, who actually was supposed to be uh, the, the ruler of France. But he died of tuberculosis uh, at a very young age in his 30s. Uh, and so he ended up on the throne instead. Uh, is what occurred. So I don't I don't know what would happen if he would have been king. It might not have been the same same problems that they had later. But France was really you know obviously behind some of these other countries like Britain uh, in not just political social changes but economic uh, as well. Uh, he did have a lot of sons. That's one thing that's weird weird about the, uh, Louis the Dauphin. He had three sons that were later kings of France, which that's pretty good if you think about it. Louis the Sixteenth, uh, Louis the Eighteenth, and also Charles the Tenth. All three of those were brothers, by the way, uh, which I'll kind of be talking about those other kings later uh, when we get to after the period of the age of Napoleon uh, and all that. Now, one of the big controversies about uh, Louis uh, the Sixteenth is his wife. If you, of course, see this image here, of course, more close up, of, of course, of uh, Louis. Louis XVI's wife, Marie Antoinette. Uh, she, of course, was the daughter, if you know about this, of Marie, Maria Theresa, of course, Austria, Austrian Empire, also the Holy Roman Empress uh, at the time. Uh, and um, she was very unpopular uh, with a lot of, you know, um, the French people. Uh, they kind of saw the uh, Habsburgs and Austria as still kind of an enemy of France, even though uh, France and Austria had become pretty much allies uh, at that time. And there's all kinds of horrible names that they called her. It's kind of kind of a sad story about that, the way they treated you know, Marie Antoinette, but she was called all kinds of names from the Austrian bitch, I think was a common name uh, they sometimes called her. I think when they were in a lot of debt, they called her Madame Deficit. It's one of the other names they called her. Madame Vito, I think, was another name, because later when uh, Louis XVI had this veto power, uh, when they had a constitutional monarchy briefly, uh, they thought she was the one that was doing all the vetoes. Uh, and then uh, there was one that was really mean and nasty, I guess I'll, I'll mention about, uh, which is the French, what they said, they said La Trebe, uh, which meant in French, uh, the lesbian. <laughs> uh, because I think there was a story where they thought, uh, when they after they first married, they, they didn't have any children, and so they thought she was a lesbian. Uh, but in reality, uh, Louis XVI suffered from something called phimosis, where he couldn't get a, like a full erection. And so they, they had trouble having children in the first few years. Uh, but after a doctor came in and had special surgery done, uh, he was able to father a bunch of children. <laughs> and I think he was actually a locksmith, like an amateur locksmith on the side. And the joke about Louis the Sixteenth also was there was something wrong with his key or something like that. Uh, but uh, there's that famous story about Louis, uh, about Marie Antoinette you may have heard about, where supposedly she said something like, let, let them eat cake. Uh, which supposedly was kind of attributed to the French peasants, the plight of them and the fact that they didn't have enough food uh, prior to the revolution breaking out. And so she heard about this and said, oh, let them eat cake instead. They don't have bread. <laughs> uh, but they think that that might actually be uh, something she actually said. Uh, I think there's a theory that there's actually a famous quote uh, that supposedly uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau said uh, in his Confessions like his famous autobiography, where he said something like, let them eat brioches. And they think that's what she really meant if she did say it. Some people don't think she said it, uh, but she's talking about brioche, which is a type of 
fancy bread uh, that has butter and eggs in it that mostly the wealthier people tend to eat more than poor people. Uh, and that might be what maybe she was talking about uh, if she said it. So, so yeah, the unpopularity of both those uh, pretty much, you know, Louis the Sixteenth and his wife was definitely considered like a major cause, you know, why, maybe. And they lived kind of this extravagant lifestyle, you know, living it up, you know, in Versailles. Uh, they were kind of, you know, basically their, their idea of life was not, you know, comparable to what most peasants were throughout France, and most people were impoverished, you know, throughout France. So the reality of life for, for them was different from what it was for most average, you know, Frenchmen anyway. Now, there's one thing, of course, I will talk about this other cause of the revolution as well. They always talk about the little ice age as being kind of another cause of why the French Revolution happened later. Uh, this was a period where uh, supposedly there was a cooling period that happened throughout, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and um, it created a lot of problems like bad harvests. Uh, France supposedly had like three bad famines right before the revolution broke out. It caused, caused a lot of food shortages, which led to a lot of like rioting and things like that uh, throughout that country. And the 20th century, there was this Dutch American uh, named Francois Mathis that coined the term Little Ice Age. And so people think that that may have been a reason of why basically it could have affected, you know, the climate of Europe that basically led to why the revolution occurred later. And there's been all kinds of theories on what caused it. Some people think the fact that the sun wasn't putting out enough solar, you know, heat basically was one theory. One popular one I know uh, is that volcanic eruptions had a lot to do with it. I think it was some in Iceland and other areas where they had volcanic eruptions. Some people claim also ocean temperatures as well as another, like the change in the ocean temperatures maybe could have affected it. And then some people think even the, that the Earth's orbit around the sun changed a little bit to affect it, uh, where the Earth was a little farther away uh, from the sun. So there's been all kinds of theories on on why this, this happened. But if you look at this uh, kind of a map, this diagram right here on the right, uh, you can see how Supposedly, there was this so-called medieval warm period that happened in Europe, et cetera, uh, which where things kind of warmed up. And so that's kind of part of why the Vikings were able to kind of settle in the northern Atlantic and all that. Uh, but then things started to cool down. Uh, you can see uh, in that period, like from the late Middle Ages up to the early modern times, they had steels where like I think the Thames River, like in like in England, froze over, uh, which I don't think it's done done that in years. So. And you can see how the temperatures start going back up, which a lot of that probably has to do with like the Industrial Revolution and all that you know, occurring later. And so things start to warm up. And or some people think that's caused by a lot of this pollution we're putting into the air, hydrocarbons and, and all that. So that's definitely kind of considered like a you know cause of the revolution for sure is maybe some kind of climatic issues that, that happened right before it uh, overall. Um, now, um, I'm going to talk also about the other thing that they think caused, you know, the, the revolution as well, which a lot of that had to do with the fact that the French Empire suffered a lot of defeats uh, in against the British Empire uh, in, throughout the 18th century. This actually went back to Louis XV's reign, but, uh, but up to that time, uh, that was a major issue of why, you know, pretty much... Uh, they think the French Empire began to decline uh, in the 1700s. And the Seven Years' War has been kind of considered one of those uh, events that they think led to that for sure because of the fact that the French lost so much territory from the war. Uh, and uh, Seven Years' War, they think, was considered the First World War. They actually think it was. They talk about the First World War, I, World War I, War II, later we have in the 20th century and all that. But I think this was considered like one of the first major wars where the European powers were fighting for control of Europe, Atlantic, uh, North America, uh, even like parts of like the Caribbean, India, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so um, that had a lot to do with, you know, why this occurred. Uh, and um, you have this so-called diplomatic revolution. That I think I talked about before how in Europe uh, the alliances shifted uh, from where Britain started to align with Prussia because both those dynasties were German, 
Uh, so you have like, you know, British Hanover dynasty, you got the Hohenzollerns, you know, Prussia and all that. And then you got Austria and France would ally with each other uh, because of the fact that, you know, Frederick the Great and Mary Maria Teresa didn't like each other. They, those two powers hated each other. And I know the Silesian Wars uh, had a lot to do with that. And so you get the shifting alliances where uh, the British Empire, Prussia, Hanover is fighting against the French Empire, Austria. And you got all these other powers that come in uh, that try to back uh, France and Austria, like Spain, Russia, the Holy Roman Empire, Sweden, I think also gets involved. Uh, as well. So those are all like very, you know, major reasons why, of course, the Seven Years War uh, would, would, of course, happen. Uh, they think that the war initially started because of Prussia again. Uh, we read about the story about that. Right, the great one at Saxony, which is kind of south of Prussia. So he invaded it <laughs> again uh, into like the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, like he did with Silesia. And so it started this other war. They sometimes call the Third Silesian Wars. Uh, they follow later that they have. And Prussia gets invaded by multiple countries. France, uh, Russia, Austria, one point invades them. They almost get overrun, of course, in the Seven Years' War. Uh, and all. So you have that going on in Europe, where all these powers are fighting against each other. Uh, and then uh, in North America, the western part of that slide you can see. Uh, then you got the, 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 yeah, the so-called uh, French and Indian War uh, that occurred. 1754 is when it broke out, uh, ends about 1763. And um, both Britain and France fought for control of not just Canada, but to control like the Great Lake, Great Lakes and maybe even the Mississippi River Valley uh, and all that. And it was called the in French and Indian War because of the fact that both sides, the French and the British, had you know Native Americans fighting on both sides, you know, during the war. Uh, so, but they had it wasn't just that; it was they were fighting in the Caribbean, in the Atlantic. Uh, they fought in India too, as well, because France had some control in part of India with the British, and so yeah, these two sides fighting that, you know, as well to control that. And when Britain ends up winning the war. Britain ends up, you know, taking all this territory throughout the world. And so that's why, you know, the British Empire will later expand uh, overall. Got a better map showing you like the seven, kind of like showing like the French and Indian War, which I guess was probably more important for France uh, more than anything. Uh, but you can see here uh, early in the war, the French actually were successful uh, for like, I think the first few years of it, like one of say the first three or four years of it. But then, the uh, British decided to put more forces, uh, men, naval power uh, into invading uh, into uh, Canada. Uh, some of the British already controlled part of Canada, like Nova Scotia, et cetera, uh, that they had. But um, what the big thing was, was that the British launched an attack into like the St. Lawrence River Valley, which was the most important aspect of, you know, uh, French Canada, New France. Uh, and uh, there was this fortress that was on Nova Scotia, you may have heard about, called the Fortress Louisbourg. So I've actually been there a few years ago. So they've actually rebuilt it. Uh, and uh, anyway, it was a very vital fortress. In fact, it protected the whole Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, and whoever controlled that pretty much controlled pretty much Eastern Canada. Uh, and so when the uh, British took it, you know, you can see there uh, that eventually is what's going to lead to the fall of really of, of New France to the French. And so from there, you can see the they have this general named James Wolfe who was really good on the British side. His, he invaded down the um, St. Lawrence River Valley. And that led to the uh, so-called, um, it's called the Battle of the Plains of Abraham. So it's called the Battle of Quebec, which happened on September 13th, 1759. And Quebec fell uh, to the British. And so after that, the French lost. You know, if you know about this, all of pretty much North America, they end up losing it. Uh, and so they have the so-called Treaty of Paris that follows afterwards. Uh, here I've got a, kind of a map showing you uh, what occurs. Uh, but basically, uh, basically the French end up losing Canada to the British. They take it all over. Uh, they even, as you can see, take over pretty much all the territory from the Mississippi River to the eastern coast of the United States today. Uh, however, the um, British wanted Florida, and so they traded 
Louisiana to the Spanish. So Spain took over basically uh, what was Louisiana, uh, that whole area you can see in green, uh, basically to the left. So if all that happens basically a uh, matter of a few years. And I think the only thing that really the French had left, if you know about this after, you know, the fall of all their North America territories, uh, was they kept like some of the Caribbean islands, like especially the, like Haiti, that St. Domain, of course, or Haiti, Haiti, which is the Western side of the Hispaniola, that was actually kept by them, uh, but pretty much everything else was mostly lost uh, to the French. Uh, they also had that famous thing where I don't know if some of you were really the you know Cajuns, you know Acadians, you know that all that today in Louisiana. But uh, they also had a deal where a bunch of like Acadians were ex were expelled uh, from Nova Scotia. Uh, they all some of them came to Louisiana. They called it the Grand Derangement, I think, was what the French called it like a long time ago. So anyway, they all come here to Louisiana, and so they kind of you know. Cajun people was, of course, the term they later, of course, described people as like that. I'm not really related to them, though. I think I'm French Creole or something on my mother's side. Uh, but some of my relatives are Cajun, French, or something like that. I, I have overall. So, But um, so that's pretty much what happened to, uh, you know, with, with Canada and all that, with the fall of that. That, that kind of changed a lot of things, of course, you know, in the world uh, with, with the French losing that. Now, there's another thing, of course, that also uh, is a major issue, uh, which, you know, ends up causing to, they think, the French Revolution later. And that, that of course, was the um, so-called American Revolutionary War, uh, American War for Independence, or we say American Revolution uh, also, also as well. Uh, and um, American Revolution, um, the French started to support the American side that, that revolted against the British. The British had these 13 American colonies, of course, that they had on the East Coast where the United States is today, uh, which were developed, you know, going back to Jamestown. Uh, however, because of British mercantilism policies, you know about this, after the Seven Years War, they started putting heavy taxes on the colonial, colonialists there. Uh, and so a lot of them rebelled. Uh, they, you know, came up with slogans like no taxation without representation. And so you have this patriot movement that starts to basically want to break away from basically the British mother country. Uh, and so the French Revolutionary War broke out in 1775, uh, which would last about seven, eight years. And eventually the French would come in and begin to support uh, the American side. Uh, I think a lot of it had to do more with like the fact that the, the, the French wanted to get back at the British. Uh, maybe they're hoping to get maybe land back or whatever, uh, but the French started to give economic military aid to the Continental Army that was fighting against, of course, uh, the British forces. George Washington, who's from Virginia, uh, you know, who had fought also in the Seven Years' War as well, uh, French Indian War, uh, he later commanded the forces, of course, of the Continental Army and would eventually lead them to victory, although it was very difficult uh, without, I think, without French European aid uh, and Spanish aid in other countries, uh, they probably would have lost. Uh, but Washington's known for, you know, later becoming, you know, the first president of the United States uh, and all of that. And yeah, French military support did help, you know, the American cause in the end. Like if you hear about the siege of Yorktown or Battle of Yorktown, which happened in the eastern part of Virginia uh, near the Chesapeake uh, Bay area, um, uh, the British were bottled up uh, because of French aid, military, naval aid, well, basically, and so October 1781 was the turning point battle, of course, of the war. And after that, the British gave up. Uh, were forced to basically, you know, recognize the United States uh, as a country. Uh, there are a lot of famous French soldiers that went over there uh, to back, you know, Washington's forces. Uh, Comte de Rochambeau you may have heard of him. Uh, he was a French marshal, uh, you know, in the uh, French, you know, military. He he was involved. Um, yeah, Admiral de Grasse, you heard about, he was like one of the top French admirals that was involved naval-wise as well. And Marquis de Lafayette, I think we've heard of him the most, you know, in Louisiana, because there's, you know, towns and places named after uh, Lafayette, uh, you know, today. Uh, he was a famous general that was also fought, of course, under Washington, was, and helped actually Washington defeat, uh, you know, the British force at Yorktown, all that. 
Uh, here, of course, is a map showing you, you know, what happened. Of course, here's George Washington, of course, going across the famous Delaware. That's a famous uh, painting, I think. It's kind of depicted in American history of showing um, the British forces surrendering to Washington, of course, at Yorktown. Uh, that's well known, of course, today. Um, but uh, here's kind of a map showing you what happened after the, of course, American Revolution, the War for Independence. Uh, you can see how the United States formed as a country, uh, which went all the way to the Mississippi River. Uh, that's basically the beginning of the United States at that point. Didn't include Florida and all that. And they had disputed territories uh, around close to where Louisiana is and Mississippi, southern Mississippi anyway. Uh, but you can see that's basically the territories. And you got, the, you got pretty much the Spanish to the west, and then you can get British Canada up there you know, to the north. So kind of give you an idea of what happened. But you can see how the French don't have much uh, possessions-wise, except predominantly in the Caribbean at that time. Right, I'm going to get into and talk more about the, you know the causes of why the you know the French Revolution, of course, you know, would break out eventually. There's one thing I did want to talk about, which is a major cause of why the French Revolution, of course, would break out. A lot of it had to do uh, with the fact that a lot of the French you know society was really unequal, uh, which it was. Uh, back they had what they call the so-called ancient regime. Uh, which is what they call the political social system of France. Uh, and in this regime, um, the social class system they had, all that, the upper classes had all the power. They controlled all the land. They had all the power, all uh, the rights in the government. They had all the privileges, uh, pretty much controlled the military, even controlled the Catholic Church uh, as well. Uh, so they had all these powers uh, that they had. And they divided the ancient regime into three social classes. You had those that were what they call the estates or estates of the realm. Uh, and they tended to break it, you can see, uh, into three, three social classes, uh, which you can see above. So you had the first estate right there, which was the clergy. Uh, so you can see that Roman Catholic clergy pretty much. Uh, it consisted of the second estate as well, uh, which was mostly nobility, I guess the monarchy and all that. Uh, with it. I think the second estate controlled most of the land, and then the Catholic Church also controlled a lot of land uh, in the country as well. And then you also had this th so-called uh, third estate. Uh, the third estate uh, is what they call the common people, or what they call the commune. I mean, commune is the French word that they used uh, for it, so-called common people. Uh, and um, the third estate was broken into three subclasses. Uh, you had the bourgeoisie, uh, which were like the upper middle class. I'll kind of explain what the deal with the nicknames. And then the urban lower classes or city workers, if you want to call them that, uh, were lower middle class type peoples uh, that lived uh, in the cities. And they had like various skills that they had, uh, but they're obviously not as wealthy, you know, compared to, say, the upper middle class, uh, which a lot of them are wealthy merchants and other skilled type people, professionals, you know, doctors, lawyers, things like that uh, in comparison. But you can see they had nicknames. Uh, bourgeoisie was called the culottes. And the urban lower class were called the sans culottes. Uh, back in those days uh, in the 18th century, people wore um, these, what they call culottes, which were these uh, pants. Well, they weren't really pants. They were more like leggings that went down uh, to around your knee. Uh, and um, it was a mark of the wealthy. Uh, and then later, when people wear pants, like go all the way down to like your ankles or whatever, that was considered for people like lower classes, you know, wearing that kind of clothing, uh, basically. So uh, sans culottes means without the, the, the you know, the, they could call it breeches, I think was the common term. They actually called it more or less. But um, then you have the peasants. I forgot about them. You know, that's, that's the other one, the third one, that the subclass that's in the, a third estate, they make up a majority of the French population. And most of them, you know, they just want to eat. They just want to be able to find cheap food, lower taxes, get rid of all these feudal ties that they've got too uh, as well, where they got to pay the church and pay the nobility uh, and everything. And uh, they're part of the reason why the revolution happens, but they think the middle class was the, was the main social class that really pushed for all the reforms that led to the revolution. 
Now, I'm going to get to the main reason, you know, why the revolution uh, would eventually break out. Uh, a lot of it had to do uh, with, um, we'll get to Abby Siaz. Abby Siaz is one of the major revolutionary figures that really starts the revolution uh, in the country. Um, and um, anyway, um, the... Um, they think that a lot of the outbreak had to do with the fact that the French government had spent a lot of money on the American Revolutionary War. Uh, and um, the country was on the verge of bankruptcy. That, that had a lot to do with it, uh, in a sense. Uh, France, by the way, had spent something like 1.3 billion livres, which was equivalent to about $350 million in American dollars today. They had spent on the war to get back at the you know, British, but they didn't get anything out of the war. Uh, in fact, I think they got more out of what more really happened. The war was all these Frenchmen went over there. They found out they're fighting for like democracy and, you know, reform, political reforms and things like that. And so that heavily influences, you know, the French revolution later. In fact, Marquis de Lafayette was one of the Frenchmen that was involved in the early part of the revolution, in the beginning, which I'll get to later about, so it causes Louis the Sixteenth to call for the Estates General, uh, which the Estates General, uh, that was basically uh, what they call the Legislative Assembly of France, which which was associated with the so-called Three Estates uh, at the time. And um, the uh, so-called Estates General originated in medieval France, going back to uh, the, I think the Valois dynasty. Uh, and uh, it didn't really have any authority. It was basically a, like an advisory body of the king. Uh, it didn't really create any laws. It wasn't like the French, you know, it wasn't like the British uh, parliament system they had compared to the French, what they had. But it didn't really do anything like raise taxes or create laws. Only the king could legislate and things like that. And it hadn't met since the time of Louis XIII's reign on 1614 because the fact that the French had gone to a divine right or absolute type regime in the country. Uh, so what happened was the um, king called for this, you know, assembly uh, to meet at Versailles, uh, which it did in the spring of 1789. And so 1,200 delegates showed up uh, that represent all the three estates, uh, which about half were in the third estate and the other half were in the first and second estates uh, that they had. What happened to cause the whole revolution to break out uh, was they, they, they couldn't figure out how to vote, like the actual estates general. It was a major issue. In fact, the whole dispute was about whether the delegates should vote by their estate or should they vote by per delegate, per head, uh, was an issue. And that's one thing that Abby Siaz, you know, brings up, you know, in his famous pamphlet on 1789, which is what is the third estate uh, that he came up with. And uh, this was a, a popular... Very, very popular uh, pamphlet that came out. I think, in, I want to say uh, February, maybe, of 79, when it came out in the early, early part of the, maybe end of the winter, I guess when it was, early spring. Uh, and um, his real name is Emmanuel Ciaz, uh, but people called him Abby Ciaz because he, at one point, was a, he ran an abbot. Well, he was an abbot of a, you know, Abbey, I guess is the word of, I guess what it was. I mean, Abbey is like a, um, a, a band that, you know, like a priest that, or a monk that controls like an abbot, which is like a monastery. But um, anyway, um, um, he published this, you know, particular pamphlet, and it became real, real popular. And uh, at the beginning of it, uh, it kind of asks like several questions that are part of, um, you know, the whole issue with the difference between the, you know, upper class and the lower classes. Uh, and uh, the course, first question was, what is the third estate? Um, what has it been uh, up to in a political order? What does it demand? So those are the kind of things that he asked in the question. So what is the third estate? Everything. And the fact that the third estate makes up the majority of the people uh, in France. Uh, what has it been up to in a political order? Uh, nothing. <laughs> uh, what does it demand to become something? So uh, he really believed that uh, the... Um, he really believed that the third estate ought to have like real power uh, in the country. Uh, he attacked like the upper classes. 
as having too many privileges, uh, too many rights, uh, the lower classes not having enough rights, uh, paying too many taxes. Uh, and so he felt like the third estate, which is like the majority of the whole population, ought to have their own democratic assembly and break away. And so that's what actually happened uh, in, in, in France. So what occurs uh, within, uh, right after, within, I guess, a few weeks after that, you have this deal where the National Assembly forms uh, in June of 1789. Uh, and uh, effectively, this actually ended the divine right or absolutism of the French regime. Uh, at least some people think it was the first great act, you know, the French Revolution, at least at least politically at that point. It's not turned violent, you know, yet. Uh, they think that's when the, the revolution really starts uh, at that point. Uh, and there's a deal where all the delegates, uh, I think a few days later, if you know about that, took a, took a famous oath that's well known called the Tennis Court Oath, uh, where they all basically say that they're going to create a constitution for France at that point. Uh, and um, that's a very famous painting that was done by the far French artist named Jacques Louis David, uh, kind of depicting romantically all the delegates, you know, taking the oath at the same time and all of that. And I think the guy that's, you can see that's on the bottom there, uh, that's in that kind of like a like a priest or monk right here, right? Uh, that's Abby C.S., one of the members, of course, taking the oath right there. Uh, and um, so if you'll see June 20th, 1789 is really the first political move uh, by, by basically uh, the third estate to try and, you know, basically do that. The National Assembly is really considered to be the first, you know, real assembly that they have uh, of France. And of course, France goes through a lot of, you know, different assemblies. We'll get to that later, but they're kind of, the French are kind of wishy-washy about what they want to do uh, at that point, but they'll go from being, you know, uh, to a constitutional monarchy uh, to eventually Napoleon coming back in uh, later after they have a republic. Uh, and so, uh, it's just going to be a kind of a nightmare uh, with that and the revolution, which I'll get to a little later about that. But at that point, that's the first political action you've got, you know, with all the delegates taking an oath uh, with the National Assembly forming at that point. It's also called the National Constituent Assembly is the other name. They sometimes call it uh, as well. But the thing we're going to get into today, for sure, I'm going to talk about the early stages of the revolution and talk about how violent it gets of course, uh, in 1789. So that's the other thing we're going to talk about next, of course, is the fact that the revolution eventually does turn violent. There, of course, is the actual oath they took, by the way, if you want to see it right here. But there's the oath. The oath was actually the National Assembly, considering that it has been summoned to establish the Constitution of the Kingdom, decrees that all members of the Assembly shall immediately take a solemn oath not to separate until the Constitution of the Kingdom established on the for on firm foundations. So uh, you know, before that, they didn't have a constitution. Uh, the king was pretty much, I guess, the rule of the land. That basically ends pretty much absolutism at that point. Now, is the king going to let them do that? That's the thing. That's kind of an issue, uh, as you know, uh, with that. Uh, and, uh, of course, one of the major is things that events that happens, you know, at the beginning of the revolution uh, is the storming of the Bastille uh, that they had. Uh, the Bastille, by the way, was this famous French political prison that was also an armory uh, as well. And it was a major symbol of the Bourbon regime uh, under Louis XVI. It kind of symbolized tyranny, uh, political repression, because a lot of people were imprisoned in it that were you know, against the regime and all that. Like Voltaire and Marquis de Sade and other people had been imprisoned there at one point. Uh, and... Um, Anyway, there was a rumor that the king was going to bring in foreign troops, mostly uh, to basically end the revolution at that point or the reforms. And there was an issue where apparently uh, he uh, fired this uh, finance minister named Jacques Necker, uh, who was very popular with the people because they felt Necker was the only man that really was in uh, Louis XVI's government that actually wanted to make especially tax reforms uh, and all that. And so the people were outraged about this. And so they think that's that's the main cause of why they stormed, you know, the Bastille uh, was, was all that uh, right there. 
And so uh, on July the 14th, 1789, that's what happened. They stormed the Bastille. Uh, you know, the violent aspect of the revolution began at that point. And there were actually some guards that were guarding it under this um, man named Marquis de Launay. And he was actually killed uh, in, in, in the actual ruckus between the French citizens and, and the troops that were guarding the actual Bastille. A lot of the soldiers switched sides, not wanting to get killed themselves and all that. You can see actually the kind of the kind of there's been a lot of paintings done of the storming of the Bastille and all that. And of course, it's not there anymore because after they stormed it and broke into it, they tore it down uh, pretty much stone by stone and all that. So um, so that was definitely a watershed moment, uh, you know, in, in French history at that point with the storming of the Bastille. Uh, now in France, you know, as you know, uh, it's celebrated as Bastille Day uh, today. Uh, Bastille Day uh, is, of course, a national day of France. Uh, that's very important to the French people today. Uh, it's kind of like compared to our, you know, July 4th celebration, you know, celebrating the United States breaking away from, you know, Great Britain, Declaration of Independence and all that. Uh, and um, but it also celebrates the fact that the French people, you know, have not just overthrown, you know, absolutism of the Bourbon regime, uh, but it's also a mark of unity among the French people. And so, you know, the French, you know, pop, up, pop off fireworks, have, you know, per military parades and uh, celebrations uh, throughout the country uh, and all that. But it wasn't really made a holiday, and you can see, until 1880 uh, under the French Republic. So it's a little later when that happens. But Benjamin Raspail, who's a French a politician is the one that came up with the idea of the Bastille Day. Now, I'm also going to get into today, I'm going to talk about uh, as well the beginning of the French Revolution uh, as well. Uh, the revolution goes through a lot of stages. Uh, some are kind of radical. Some are kind of moderate uh, in their phases. Uh, there, Of course, at the beginning, there was one phase you can see uh, that was called the Great Fear uh, that occurred at the beginning of the revolution it happened mostly around the summer of 1789 after the after the you know the Bastille stormed uh, at that point and so what happened throughout France was that the revolution spread so it started like you know Versailles and Paris and spread to the rest of the whole country and you get the deal where all the peasants get involved on things like that as well so mass hysteria panic throughout the country that's what they call it, you know great fear you know, because of this, you know, great panic that goes across the country. The peasants actually form these um, mobs of peasants. I think they call them brigands or something like that. They began to actually attack the nobility's manors throughout throughout France. And a lot of nobility actually fled the country uh, as immigrants. Uh, and, um, and then, like, the women in Paris even had a thing where uh, they marched on Versailles because they were starving and the food prices were out of control. Uh, throughout the country, so-called Women's March, uh, they call it the Versailles, uh, which occurs in October 1789. There's actually a deal where the French people storm the Palace of Versailles. They actually break into the palace, and they almost killed Marie Antoinette. I think they went into her bedchamber, hacked up her bed <laughs> and all that, and they forced the king and queen. They seized them and forced them to live in actual Paris uh, instead. So you have that all going on at that point. And then you get all these radical changes that, that come to the country uh, afterwards uh, because of the National Assembly, you know, taking control. Um, uh, and there's also the so-called Paris Commune, which was a revolutionary government that, that takes control of Paris uh, afterwards. And uh, the big thing that happens is they, they the National Assembly starts passing a lot of these reforms that are kind of radical at the time, but they they called them later the so-called August Decrees. And what they did was it took away privileges away from the nobility. Uh, and basically after that, uh, everybody was considered all equal as, quote, citizens is a term they start using uh, for all French people, French men especially. They end serfdom. Uh, they end pretty much feudalism throughout the country. Uh, also, ch uh, church tithes are also abolished, which a lot of the lower class had to pay uh, toward the Catholic Church. Uh, and all that. And then the big thing that came out, you can see there in that slide, is the fact that the Declaration of the Rights of Man uh, was adopted uh, in the country in 1789. Uh, this was like a, um, 
Declaration of Rights that came out uh, that made all French male citizens like equal uh, throughout the country uh, to protect people's you know, liberty, property, and other rights uh, they had. Uh, and um, they believed that the actual uh, Declaration of Rights of Man was developed by mostly two men, uh, Abby Siez and Marquis de Lafayette, those two men that were kind of involved in the revolution in the beginning. They helped to write it, like draft the actual Declaration of Rights of Man, which later is kind of put in as a preamble into a lot of you know French constitutions, I think which it is still today. Uh, and um, they supposedly say that Thomas Jefferson was kind of did some consulting on it, that he helped them write it or gave some ideas to write it, uh, who had written the Declaration of Independence back in 1776. Uh, and so... Uh, they, they do think that Jefferson had some kind of influence you know, in the writing of it. Uh, they also adopted some other things that are real famous, too, uh, in the Revolution uh, that I'll mention as well. Uh, also, um, that's the date they adopted it, too. You can see August 26, 1789. Uh, they adopted a slogan of the Revolution, uh, which is liberty, equality, uh, fraternity. Fraternity is like the brotherhood of man, uh, those ideas. Also, the famous tricolor, you know, flag of France, the national, you know, flag of France, uh, begins to be adopted uh, at that point, uh, which is blue, blue, white, and red. And so they took away the, you know, the traditional flag of the monarchy, which I think was mostly white, had fleur de lis on it and things like that that we're familiar with in Louisiana. Uh, and so that became the flag. I think over time it becomes eventually the national flag, but I think traditionally they're kind of. I don't think it was official yet, but it will later, I know, become the national flag. They say that um, Marquis de Lafayette was kind of instrumental in developing uh, the famous uh, tricolor flag of France. But also Jacques Louis David, the famous French artist, they think also had some suggestions too about, about uh, the actual flag itself, more or less. Uh, now, I'm going to get more into it later, but I'll, I'll talk about the radicals taking over the country. That's one thing that does happen after, you know, the, the revolution kind of breaks out. But France eventually does create a constitution. It does take them a while uh, to adopt it uh, in 1791, one of several constitutions they de develop in this period uh, later. But uh, basically, it creates a constitutional monarchy with... Um, a unicameral assembly, which was called the Legislative Assembly at the time. Uh, and it gave the king some limited powers, but he didn't have the powers of divine right as he had before. He did have something called a suspension veto, where he could veto a certain bill or whatever passed by the, by the actual French parliament. It kind of got him a lot of hot water, you know, about that vetoing, uh, you know, various things that might be popular with the revolution. Uh, and all that. They do think that it helps to kind of facilitate his fall from power, because uh, a lot of people don't trust the monarchy. Uh, they think he's really uh, more or less uh, more pro-Austrian in other countries in Europe, because his wife is, you know, from Austria. That didn't help. Uh, and so uh, there's a deal where in uh, June of 1791, right before the actual uh, constitution is adopted, his, his family tries to flee the country. They call it the so-called Flight of, of Varennes, uh, where he and his family disguised themselves, and they were going to actually flee to the Austrian Netherlands. They were trying to get help uh, from some of his powers in here, like Austria, maybe Prussia and other countries, uh, that would help out them get their throne back. Because uh, at this point, they're starting to lose it, uh, they think. Uh, and um, But they're caught halfway to the border. Uh, and um, what ends up happening is they're put under house arrest. Uh, the Louis the Sixteenth his family were put up in what they call the Tuileries Palace, which was part of the uh, Western Wing of the Louvre. Uh, and so they're watched very carefully. And pretty much, it was like he's a figurehead. That's pretty much what it is. Now, with that going on, so Louis kind of his powers are pretty much neutered in the country. The other thing that happens is that the Jacobins. Uh, and other radical pol uh, political groups start to take over the country at this point, uh, at the beginning of the revolution. Uh, and um, the one, the main one that took over was the Jacobin Club, which was actually this political club that become that became popular 
at the beginning of the revolution in Paris and throughout France. And uh, they were radicals that wanted to basically abolish the monarchy. That was their main goal of what they wanted to do. And a lot of them wanted more of a Republican type state you know, to be put in power uh, instead. But they, were, they weren't all together, if you know about this. They were broken up into different type of political factions, which the two main ones were the Girondists and the Montanards, or the Mountain, as they were called uh, as well, or Mountain Men, if you want it that way, uh, as well. And uh, they had one famous leader that was real big on the Jacobins, who was kind of radical, and that was Maximilien Robespierre, who was a famous lawyer uh, and French politician, uh, who was real big uh, in the revolution. And uh, we'll get to Robespierre later, but Robespierre is going to be one of the main leaders that really instigates what is later called the so-called Reign of Terror, uh, as they called it. He had a nickname. He was called the Incorruptible because uh, he couldn't be corrupted, uh, they believe. Uh, one thing about the French Assembly at that time, uh, which is very, very famous uh, today, if you ever study about politics much uh, or political theory and all that, uh, they do think that the, this particular assembly is what started the whole left-right political spectrum that we all know today. Like left is more like liberal, right is more conservative and all that. Well, it started there uh, in this particular assembly. And so those that sat on the left or far left were either liberal or radical, uh, basically. Like the Montanars were kind of considered more radical. Uh, and in the center, you had people that are more moderate. Like I think they say that Girondists were kind of moderate or maybe left of center center left maybe a little bit. Uh, and then all to the right, you have those that are more conservative, like so, so-called so royalists or whatever that, are, that were in the assembly uh, as well. So all that's kind of where that comes from, you know, later uh, in modern times. Like United States, I guess it's Democrats more liberal and then Republicans are more, uh, those are more conservative. Uh, now, what happened though was that uh, the French eventually got tired of, of Louis the 16th. They, they find out later that Louis the 16th was actually conspiring uh, with Austria uh, to try to undermine the country and get military aid. So I'll get to it later. They had the French Revolutionary Wars that break out. And so the Tuileries Palace is actually stormed uh, in August of 1792. They storm it. At that point, what happens is the the French decide that they're not going to have a monarchy anymore. And so they establish the so-called First Republic of France uh, is put in. They actually create a new parliament that's called the National Convention Parliament uh, that's in power for around three years or so. Now, the bad thing about this is that it starts a big war uh, in Europe. In fact, we have wars break out in Europe that last up to like 1814, 1815 uh, because of the French Revolution. And all that. And so you have the so-called French Revolutionary Wars uh, that break out over like a 10-year period. 1792 is about when it breaks out. And it goes up to like 1802. And so all these countries in Europe, Austria, Prussia, you can see Britain, Russia, Spain, all those down there, of course, all those get involved in the revolution, uh, revolutionary war against the against the French, uh, because they're kind of concerned that their country, their monarchy might get overthrown. Uh, about this revolution. Uh, they don't like the idea of a Republican-type state, which is really not popular still. I think in Europe, people didn't view that as really being... And the United States is kind of a new thing, you know, uh, at that time. Uh, but that wasn't really a popular form of government. But um, Prussia at one point tried to invade, which is crazy, uh, in September 1792. Uh, and for some reason, miraculously, what happened was the French were able to rally and defeat them at the Battle of Valme. Uh, and so uh, that prevented really at that point the, the European powers from coming, on, com coming in and really stopping the revolution at that point. Because what ends up happening, you know, about the revolution, it turns like really violent at that point, especially starting in 1793. And that's the thing I want to talk about next uh, that really gets started, of course, is that Robespierre, he starts to take over the country uh, at that point. That's what I want to get into mostly and talk about today, is about what happens under him. Uh, yeah, they have the so-called Reign of Terror, which happens over like a year or so between 1793 to 94. Uh, what happens is Jacob, uh, the Jacobins, um, especially the, the radical uh, Montanards, they seize control of the country and they create this dictatorship. Uh, where for a while they kind of suspend the constitution uh, of the country. 
And they create this committee that was famous called the Committee of Public Safety. Uh, what was it? Uh, it was kind of like this provisional government that ran the country and had 12 men on a committee. It was still a republic, but it was more like a dictatorship is what it was. And they controlled the country internally. Uh, and one of the things they started doing uh, during the revolution this time uh, was they basically began to uh, crack down on any kind of uh, counter-revolutionary activities that were against the regime. And so it, it set off a political wave of repression throughout the country, where they basically arrested people that they thought were against the regime. Uh, and so the Jacobins massacred and executed thousands of people uh, throughout the country. Like maybe as many as 40,000 uh, may have been killed uh, at one point uh, under the Jacobins. I think they're not sure exactly the numbers. And yeah, other people that were even in prison. I think they even massacred priests. Uh, they were in like Catholic priests that were uh, in prison uh, and all that. And uh, one of the big things that becomes real popular during the regime, if you know about it, uh, is the guillotine. It's something they start using that became a major symbol, you know, uh, of the French of the French Revolution, uh, especially of the reign of terror. You know, when you think of the French Revolution, that's one of the main things usually people think about, uh, of course, is the use of the guillotine. And uh, the guillotine was actually designed, believe it or not, by one of Louis XVI's doctors who was trying to find a more humane way uh, to execute people. His name is Dr. Antoine Louis. Uh, and so he worked with Louis XVI to come up with a design that would eventually execute him himself. It's funny about that, if you think about it. Uh, they do think it's um they do think it was influenced by German variations. Like the Germans for years had their own guillotines they had, which were more compact, which they called there's the uh default bell, which means the falling axe, I think it was called. And um, but it got named after this other man. Uh, named Joseph Guillotine. He was also a doctor. Uh, he was also a member of the assembly. And he was a major a supporter of its use. He thought that it, would sh it should be used against criminals and other people because uh, it was more humane. Uh, and uh, before that, you know, there was no equality among man, women or whatever, about how he should be executed. Uh, but if you're a nobility, you know, you got the best form of execution, which was usually, if you know about that, uh, they would basically cut your head off with an axe, which is actually the best way to execute you back in those days, believe it or not. Hanging and other forms of methods, you know, drawn and quartering, burnt at the stake, uh, those were considered worse, you know, compared to, you know, getting your head chopped off. That's a lot faster, you know, doing it that way. <laughs> I know. Uh, there's a lot of famous people, by the way, that were executed, of course, with the guillotine. I think those are the three most famous that were later executed. Uh, Louis the Sixteenth, of course, January 1793. His wife was executed, Marie Antoinette, about 10 months later. And Maximilian Rosemary was also executed himself, believe it or not, at the end of the Reign of Terror in July of 1794. Just kind of giving some ideas about that. Oh, here's some stats, too, on the um, actual guillotine. Uh, you can see that they think the Germans, like, influenced it. I think it was a German engineer, they think, that influenced the development of it, of its development, believe it or not, right there. But they first started using it in 1792 against political prisoners, and then after that, they started using it on anybody. Uh, but um, you can see it was used up to 1977, which is most recent. So, so it was used up to like the uh, late late 20th century uh, overall. Uh, the French actually called it the National Razor. That was the actual name they later called it as a nickname. Uh, but they did have other names. They sometimes tried to call it, but it became, those names became unpopular, like Luzette and others, because of the fact that it was named after Louis, or similar to Louis's name, and they didn't want to do that name, uh, you know, so that, that became very popular, the so-called National Razor. Uh, those are statistics on the guillotine, so you can see it was very heavy, so it weighed close to almost 1,300 pounds, the blade itself weighed almost 90 pounds, uh, so imagine this thing coming down on the back of your neck as it cut your head off, uh, we can see the blade drop on it was about 90 inches from the top, and it came down very fast. Now, the blade drop was about 21 feet per second. That's how quick it was. Uh, the impact on your head um, was also pretty big, too. Powered impact was supposedly 888 pounds per square inch. Wow. So 
just give you an idea of how big of a thrust that was when it took your head off. So that's why they have a basket there, because if they didn't have the basket, your head would just fly off, uh, basically. There's also theories about, you know, when people would get their head cut off that they could still see or, you know, and things like that. And, of course, their facial expressions would keep going, like their eyes moving and things like that. A lot of that, I think, is reflexes. Like when you cut off a, you ever cut off a, or, or seen a lizard's tail get cut off or something like that? It'll keep moving around or something like that. Uh, and so, yeah, that's just kind of something that happens because of reflexes after you get your head cut off and things like that. But um, anyway, um, let me get into talk about, of course, some of the other things that happened with the revolution. Uh, yeah, other people that, of course, are famous in the revolution that's well known. Uh, they always talk about the death of Marat uh, in the revolution. who became like a big martyr uh, overall. He was actually... Uh, killed by this pro um, Gerondus uh, named uh, Charlotte Corday. Uh, he was killed on July 13, 1793, and they think his death had a lot to do with why they think Marie Antoinette was executed, like put on trial and executed uh, and all that. Uh, and uh, Marat was this um, spokesperson, if you want, for the Jacobins and the, and the revolution. He had a newspaper called The Friend of the People. Uh, and anyway, uh, he was famous for quotes like, in order to ensure public tranquility, 200,000 heads must be cut off. Uh, and so um, his death kind of sparked, you know, a lot of other deaths, not just Marie Antoinette, but others were, were sent to the guillotine uh, as well. And Jacques Louis David, you know, made a famous painting of that. It might have been one of his greatest paintings he maybe ever done, uh, which kind of romanticized, you know, Marat's death and uh, him becoming like a martyr, of course, later. But Charlotte, Charlotte Corday, I think I've got an image of her. He had some women, you know, involved with the revolution, you know, that were there. She basically was later executed for it, too, you know, for killing, uh, of course, um, you know, uh, Marat. Uh, yeah, uh, the execution of Marie Antoinette, I kind of briefly talk about that. Like I said, she was put put to death in October uh, of uh, 1793. Uh, and uh, she, they really didn't have to put her on trial. I think she was kind of seen as a scapegoat, you know, to the French people still, uh, even though her husband, Louis XVI, had gone to the guillotine uh, in January earlier in the year. Uh, and uh, But she was put on trial and then executed. Uh, and there's a very famous incident that happened with her death. I don't know if you have heard the story about this, but it's kind of famous. But when she went to get executed, she stepped on the executioner's foot, which was an accident, by the way. She said something like, pardon, I didn't mean to do it on purpose. I didn't do it on purpose or something like that. That's what she said. <laughs> she said, yeah, I should have done it on purpose. <laughs> that kind of deal. But but anyway, but uh, yeah. Her death was really tragic, I think, you know, if you think about the revolution in general uh, and all that. And, um, you know, they're cutting women's head off and things like that, which is you know, really ridiculous at that point. So um, I'm going to get to, of course, Robespierre. Robespierre, you know, he they end up going too far. That's one thing that's going to end up happening. They're going to eventually get overthrown uh, at that point. But I did want to talk about the fact that Robespierre uh, and his Jacobins, they really, they really kind of do start doing like a lot of radical changes to the country, uh, where they really try to even change like the the whole state itself, even religion. They they try to get rid of Christianity and, and things like that uh, throughout the throughout the country. And from a speech he gave one time, I know they started calling his reforms the so-called Republic of Virtue, uh, and um, examples of some things that he did uh, that are very famous. Most famous thing that that uh, the Jacobins did was they adopted this uh, deist cult that they called a cult of the supreme being, which they adopted in 1793. And the idea of it was to create a state religion that was more based on the Enlightenment and not based on Christianity, especially Catholicism in general. And so they basically abolished the Catholic religion in the country. They closed down all the churches, closed down all the monasteries, closed down convents, um, things like that. And so those kind of things were things that they did the country that were very famous uh, during that time. Any kind of similar to the monarchy, they basically uh, tried to eliminate images of the monarchy, uh, statues of the monarchy, kings, queens, nobility, whatever. 
Uh, there's even a weird thing where they took all the actual cards, like, you know, playing cards uh, people have. They took away the actual face cards, like king, queen, joker cards they have, you know, uh, that are in like playing decks or whatever. They took, they actually removed those because they didn't want anybody to see that there's a king or queen or could be, uh, things like that. Uh, the most famous thing they did also during the revolution was they adopted a so-called revolutionary calendar, uh, which um, was this anti-Christian calendar because they didn't want anybody to know that, that there's, you know, Christian holidays and things like that that are part of the traditions of, you know, Christianity and Catholicism uh, in general. And they made it based on more on on things like reason, uh, science, uh, the seasons, uh, and so on. And so what they did was they took the calendar and they started over. Have you ever thought about this whole deal where they basically uh, went to so-called year one, as they called it, where they started over, not from the birth of Christ, but from the revolution, like with the Jacobins. And so 1792 or 93 became like year one, 1793, 94 became year two, 1794, 95 became year three. Uh, and so that's how they basically you know, have this calendar system that they have. Mm. Uh, and Napoleon later abolished in 1806, but they used it for quite a few years, uh, the actual calendar. It was called different things. They call it the uh, uh, French Revolutionary Calendar, and then some people call it the Republican Calendar. So it's 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 called different things, uh, they called it. Uh, they also divided the weeks up and the months. This is another thing you do. It was kind of strange. But all the 12 months were based off of the seasons, like what kind of season they had uh, at the time. Uh, they even divided the weeks into 10 days uh, as well. So you have three weeks in a month instead of maybe around four months, four, four weeks in a month. So it's kind of strange uh, the way they arranged it. But they didn't want anybody to know like when a certain holiday would be, when Christmas is and you know things like that, certain saints' holidays and stuff like that. That's why they did that. Uh, and you can see all the different names they came up with uh, right here. Like um, you got Vendemir, which has to do with like vintage, like doing with like, I guess when doing wine and things like that, I know room air, fog month, premier frost month, nevo snow month, Plu pluvos rain, ventos wind, germinal budding, floral flowers, prairial meadow. It's like a spring months, I guess. Uh, and then the uh, summer months are like mesador, thermador, fructador, harvest heat, fruit, things like that. So I guess fruit is when they collect all the fruit and grapes and things like that. And then Vandermeer is when they would make the wine and all that. So, so it's kind of weird the way they would set up all these dates uh, and all that. And I think the British made fun of it and all that. Uh, but it was kind of weird uh, what they were trying to do on the country. So, and so that's all these, uh, you know, changes, I guess, uh, eventually led to um, him being overthrown. That's one thing, of course, that would happen eventually was that, the Girondists, who were kind of more moderate, were kind of getting tired of this. Some of them had even been executed uh, by, by the uh, Montagnards. They overthrew basically Maximilian uh, in July of 1794, what became known as the Thermidorian Reaction or Thermidorian Revolution. Uh, some people thought it was a revolution within a revolution uh, at that point. Uh, and so the moderates seize control. There's even a, dear, a period where they have what they call a white terror, where they go after people that were, you know, pro-Jacobin, especially the pro pro Montanards. Uh, they have they imprison or kill them uh, throughout the country. Uh, and so he's actually executed. That's one thing that's very famous uh, at the end of the revolution is that Robespierre is actually sent to the guillotine himself, uh, and he's eventually executed. Uh, that's, of course, what happens. So the radical aspects of the revolution uh, is pretty much over. It does keep going. Uh, the revolution, of course, does continue down to 1799. The French directory government, it would seize power at the end of the revolution from 1795 to 1799. Uh, that was a Republican government uh, that was more moderate uh, that came into power after uh, Maximilian was overthrown uh, at that point. And uh, the, the French directory uh, was a government uh, that was controlled by this committee. It was a committee of five executive officials, which they called them, nicknamed so-called directors, but they called them. And it also had an assembly uh, that it had too, uh, which was a bicameral legislative body, which 
not sure it ever had an official name. I think it's called a legislative legislative body or legislative assembly, I think is what they called it uh, again. And um, it ruled France for about four years uh, over the country. Uh, and it had these two chambers it had. It was one called the Council of 500. It was one called the Council of Age Ancients uh, that they had uh, that was part of it. I think I've got a, I think I've got, um, I thought I had something on that, but I don't, looks like I don't have anything on that. But um, I think one body I know created the laws and the other one passed it. I know that. And then uh, they would also choose like who the directors would be, like the actual executive figures that would help run it. And the, the actual executive leader that was like the head of the government, they always talk about the most, is Paul Barat. He's really uh, considered the most important one. Uh, that was in power. And he's very important, Barat, because Barat is the one that would give Napoleon Bonaparte a chance. If you know him, he gave like early commissions uh, to take over the country. Uh, and so Napoleon, Napoleon is going to rise to power during that time. You see that guy on the left there, not the other guy on the right. <laughs> they were in Napoleon Dynamite, right? That's another guy. But uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, you know, he's eventually going to seize power uh, over the country because the directory was really a weak government. It was not that powerful uh, compared to previous administrations uh, that had been in power. And Napoleon becomes real popular in Europe, you know, because of his military successes fighting the European powers. And he's going to eventually be able to overthrow the directory and take take control of the country. And uh, that that's eventually, of course, going to lead into the so-called age of Napoleon you know, that we have that follows, of course, after that. So that's in a nutshell, you know, what the French Revolution uh, was pretty much about. Uh, they kind of go through all these different stages, kind of moderate to very radical, and then back to back to being moderate. And then what happens is Napoleon comes in, uh, takes over the Republic. And then what's going to happen, what's really interesting about that, he's going to turn into a monarchy again uh, when he becomes emperor uh, in, of course, 1804. So I'll talk about that later in the week. We'll get into the uh, age of Napoleon uh, we'll talk more about uh, Napoleon's like rise to power as a, as a French general uh, under, under the directory government. And then we'll talk about the stages that Napoleon uh, goes through with the country, you know, first with the so-called French consulate, and then we'll get into the empire of Napoleon, Napoleonic empire, uh, which of course sparked the so-called Napoleonic wars. So that's it for today. Uh, I think a little longer than I should have today. I know uh, but um, if you have any questions, of course, about this lecture, you know, please let me know, of course, later. Uh, you can always you know, leave me comments anytime you want. I don't think there's any comments I know. I know there was a question, I think, somebody had mentioned about my accent or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I, know I do have kind of a Southern drawl, I know, for sure. So y'all y'all take care. Uh, y'all have a great, of course, uh, rest of the week uh, overall. Now, of course, see y'all later, of course, uh, when we talk about Napoleon. So y'all take care.